I walk the chain of dogs. G'day to all you lovely people and welcome back to my channel. I'm Kathy and today I want to talk about this. Dead House Gates by Steven Erickson, the second book in Malazan, the Book of the Fallen series. And this is a really thick book. It's well over 900 pages. And there is so much I want to say about this book, though I'm sure I'm going to miss a few things. Now, I have been wanting to do this video for quite a while, but I got the flu. After getting the flu shot, would you believe? And I'm still recovering. I've still got a lingering cough. So if I sound croaky, that's why. All right. Now, I do want to talk about spoilers. So I'm going to be splitting this video into three parts. There is a without spoilers section with spoilers and a score and summary at the end. And timestamps will be in my description box below. And when I say spoilers, I'm talking about Dead House Gates only. If you have not read Gardens of the Moon, then you should skip this video until you do. All right, where do we begin? <laughs> there is just so much going on in Dead House Gates that it's hard to keep it all clear in my head. And that is something I realized after finishing this book is that it would greatly benefit from a reread because there is so much happening in it including in the first book i suspect that this series is one you'll enjoy even more on a reread because you will have a better grasp of what is going on because just like gardens of the moon this is also a book that you need to piece together the author does not explain all that much and there is so much happening that it will take some time to figure out who is who and what is their position in this story, in this book. Personally, I love that about this series, that I'm not spoon fed anything. I'm allowed to draw my own conclusions from what I'm reading. But I also know that I have missed so many things, which I will hopefully pick up on a reread. I've already talked about Erickson's writing, the world building, the magical system, etc., from the first book, which also applies to this one. However, I would add that the writing is sharper in this one. The plotting is definitely sharper, clearer, I think, in some ways. And it is also more complex even than Gardens of the Moon because there are quite a few storylines that are interwoven and intersect throughout this book. But one thing I noticed in this book, which I didn't pick up on so much in the first, is how much Erickson's background in archaeology has come through. When he talks about cities or places throughout this book, he often talks also about the ruins of ancient civilizations beneath these cities, which I really loved actually, because now I'm curious about these ancient civilizations. I want to know a lot more. And we do get to learn a little bit about, say for example, the Talan Imas, the Trowels, the Jagoots, though I think there's still a lot more that we can learn about them. But I really loved this reminder that we don't exist in a vacuum. We come from a long, long history where there have been civilizations, some great ones that have come and gone throughout the ages. So let's talk about the plot, <laughs> or I should say plots, because there are quite a few different plots, storylines throughout Dead House Gates. I counted at least seven, <laughs> and there's probably more. One is Sheikh, I don't know how to pronounce that, the seer of the seven cities 
who has predicted that a whirlwind, an uprising is going to take place in the seven cities. We have heard about this possible uprising in the first book and Dead House Gates is all about the uprising in the seven cities. Then we have the storyline of the bridge burners, Fiddler and Kalam, who are escorting Crocus and Apsala back to her home village where she was taken by Cotillion. Kalam, the bridge burner and ex Claw, also has his own storyline at some point. And I don't want to give away any spoilers by saying what that is, except that he was a citizen of the Seven Cities. Then there is another storyline with Thalison, Paran's youngest sister, who has been made a slave by their older sister, I think it's Tavor, who is now the new adjunct to the Empress Lucene. And this is not telling you anything you don't learn very early on in the book. In company with Thalison is also Hiboric, an ex-priest of Fena, excommunicator priest, He's also had his hands cut off, as well as a thug, all who are heading to the Otateral Mines. Otateral is the metal that is in the adjunct sword, which can resist magic. And near the beginning, I think it might have been the first chapter, we meet Mappo and, what is it, Icarium. Mappo is a trowel and Icarium is a half Jagged, who we have heard a lot about in Gardens of the Moon. And they are companions who are on a journey and have been, I think, for a very long time. Then there is Culp, a mage who has been sent to recover Heberic from the mines. And he goes there together with Gessler and Stormy and other soldiers. We also have the storyline of Duca, the Empress's historian, or soldier turned historian, who goes to meet Coltane, a Wiccan leader who has been appointed fist of the 7th Malaz army. Coltane and his Wiccans had actually fought the Malazan Empire under the previous leader, but have now become loyal soldiers of Malazan. Another major, very significant plot is Coltane's attempt to save, I think it's 30,000 refugees. The chain of dogs, yeah. <laughs> As you can see, there are a lot of different storylines in this book and it can be difficult to keep track of all of them and realize the significance of each storyline to the overall story, which is really about this major rebellion in the Seven Cities against the Empire of Malazan. And I have to confess, when I started Dead House Gates and I was at least, I think, 20% in, I was disappointed because I didn't see the bridge burners and that's what I was expecting. I was expecting to see Darragistan and instead I was learning about Duca and Coltane and Fallison and Mapo and the two bridge burners only, Fiddler and Kalam. So I was not happy. <laughs> I'll admit it, I really wasn't. I thought, oh no, I'm not going to enjoy this as much as Gardens of the Moon. That changed. Yeah, and that's all I really need to say at this point in the video. But what I do want to say, and I'm trying very hard here to keep away from any spoilers whatsoever, is that... This is very complicated because there are so many intersecting storylines, but it also made it very interesting. You don't have time to get bored with any particular characters because you then jump over to other characters and their storyline. 
and there is a lot of mystery attached, for example, with Mepo and Icarium. Who are they? What is their journey about? Other storylines like Kalam's, for example, becomes very obvious very early as to what his goal is. But there is enough mystery attached to the other storylines that you wonder how are they going to connect? Are they going to connect or are they completely separate? As for these new characters, because there are a lot of new characters in this book, hmm, I loved a lot of them, really did. I got so attached to them that when anything negative happened, I would get quite upset about it, which surprised me. Given my reaction at the beginning of the book, I did not expect to become as attached as I did to some of these characters. And then there were characters that I absolutely hated. Yeah, and I'll confess, Fallison was one. I have really struggled with her character, for example, because part of me felt like I should be able to empathize with her, what she had gone through, being betrayed by her own sister and made a slave. And she was very young. She was only, I think, 14 when she was enslaved. But her behavior at the Otatoral Mines, I found very hard to admire. So I found myself torn, wanting to empathize with her and yet despising her as well for her choices. However, I kept reminding myself she is so young and she did have something horrible happen to her, something absolutely unforgivable. Her own sister betrayed her. I cannot go into too much detail though regarding her character because she does have a significant arc in the book. Then we have Duca. I think that's right, the historian. And initially I was a little bored with him. I thought, you know, what's so interesting about this character? I don't know. I don't know if I even want to read about him. But as time progressed, as we got to know him better, learned his history, as we listened to his observations about what was happening during this rebellion, I became greatly attached to this character. Yeah. I also became greatly attached to Culp, this mage, and the soldiers. Their storyline became so fascinating that I just wanted to read about them because they go through some wondrous adventures, some horrible adventures too. And Mapo and Icaria, new characters to us. By the time the book finished, I loved these characters both so much. I became so attached to them as well. Their story was tragic and yet uplifting as well. Yeah, and that's all I want to say in this part of the video. Fiddler, yeah. Fiddler is a sapper, I think, and we met him in the first book, but we didn't spend a lot of time with him. We got to know him so much better in this book, and I adored him. <laughs> yeah, he became one of my favorite characters in this book. I just loved learning so much more about this character and realizing who he was. I was not as attached to Callum. No, I don't know how to pronounce that. I'm sure I got that wrong as well. But I just didn't find myself as attached to him. And whilst I really did enjoy his story, I also liked the conflict in him that we saw. Being a soldier of Malazan, as well as growing up in the Seven Cities. And I liked how Erickson handled it. It was sensitively done, how we could easily be conflicted by our divided loyalties. 
that you could be loyal to both sides of a conflict sometimes. And this is something I've realized that he does very, very well. Yeah. Coltane. <laughs> yeah. Where do I start with Coltane? I adored this character. He was also a very mysterious figure for much of the book, but his actions I felt spoke much louder than the few words he said throughout the book. He didn't need to speak. His actions showed us who he was and wow, I just adored this character. I'd say he was my favorite. And then there were secondary characters whose names escape me right now, who I became very attached to as well, and who have significant parts in the story as well. I thought the character development in Dead House Gates was fantastic. And that I think that is one of the greatest strengths in this book, the characters. In addition to the plot, yeah. All right, what else can I say without touching on spoilers? I can say this. Whilst I might have been a little lukewarm to begin with regarding Dead House Gates, it took me a while to warm up to these new characters. But this book <laughs> shattered me. I was a mess <laughs> after finishing it. I couldn't believe what had happened in the last, oh, I don't know, 100 odd pages. And I know I can't tell you why, because it is a spoiler, major spoilers. And honestly, if you have not read this book, please, please do not watch the spoiler section as it will completely destroy your enjoyment of it. You need to read this cold without knowing what is going to happen. So now let's jump into the spoiler section. I know what I'm going to end with. It is Coltane and the Chain of Dogs, but I want to talk about a few other things before I get to that. Mepo and Icaria. Their story is so tragic. And whilst initially I didn't feel any great connection with them, seeing this amazing friendship that they have, which is based really on lies, on Mapo trying to protect the world from Icarium's rage, it just broke my heart. Yeah, for them, for Mapo in particular, who has been carrying this burden, I carry him is clueless. He doesn't know what's going on. That's what he's trying to figure out, trying to remember. But just seeing Mapo's devotion to I carry him, I loved that so much. Then there is Fiddler. He has grown into such a magnificent character. I absolutely love his character. I love how strong and devoted he is and funny and kind. Him rescuing those little girls from being raped, that I think says everything about this guy. He is so honorable. Crocus and Apsala, mm. Crocus grew on me more as the book progressed. I found him initially a little boring, but you could see he was slowly changing and becoming stronger, more mature, I guess. And Apsala, initially we were told she would remember nothing about being possessed by a cotillion. And then it seems that she still has some of the skills and memories of him. I did like her, I didn't hate this character. I just thought that she needed a little bit more development. I didn't feel I learned as much about her as I would have liked. And maybe it's because I don't know if it is her or if it is all these memories and skills from Cotillion. In the end, I felt that she was neither. She was perhaps something new, yeah. The 
coincidence of her father being the servant for that crazy priest, well, I found that a little too coincidental, but given that the author had kind of set this groundwork that Shadow Throne and Rope probably have a long end game, perhaps it's not so surprising. Though it was unexpected to learn that in fact they are Kalimbad, the old emperor and dancer. Hmm. I'm not sure how I feel about that. There was no real hint. Well, actually, no, I can't say that. It was quite clear that they hated Empress Lacine, so perhaps that was always Ericsson's intention to reveal their true identities, but they're also quite different from what they would have been when they were mortals. Fella son. I've already spoken that I did not like this character and when they left the mines, she was unbearable. <laughs> she was just such utter poison. I absolutely hated this character. It was very hard to like her. I don't think you were meant to like her. And as I said before, I was conflicted because I wanted to empathize with this young girl, but I just found her impossible to like. And whilst there is a point where she seems to finally, finally put aside some of this poison and mature a little, I just don't know if I buy that she has really turned over a new leaf. The fact that she is reborn, kind of, as Shaikh, that does not kind of wipe the slate clean for me. And obviously it suited her purposes because she is still seeking vengeance against her sister, which I can't blame her for, but still, she's still a child. I just don't know if I've seen that much significant growth in her. I've seen some, but not a lot yet. And I still don't like her. <laughs> yeah, I really don't. Anyone else was really upset that Culp the Mage was killed? I was like, why? He was actually developing into a very interesting character, which I wouldn't have thought at the beginning. I just thought he was a mage who was on this mission that Duca had sent him on, but he was really talented and funny at times. And I loved his relationship with these soldiers, Gessler and the others. I thought it was wonderful. So I was very upset when he, he was killed. I just thought it came out of nowhere. And Gessler and the others might actually be ascending and their travels, their adventures were some of the most interesting, in my opinion, in this book because it was about other planes and part of the history of Malazan that I need to learn so much more about. And I hope we see them again. Though I don't think we're going to see Culp again, unfortunately. Yeah. Let's move on to Kalam. I knew he wasn't going to kill the Empress. That was no surprise. Though I guess seeing him fighting off all the claw that were after him just showed us how brilliant an assassin he is. In my view, I thought his storyline was kind of the weakest. Though it did surprise me that he took this holy book to the desert. I did not think he would do that given his loyalty to the Empire as well. But I was really shocked at the end when Lucene said that I think it's Duca, the High Fist in Darugistan was actually seemingly splitting from Malazan deliberately and with her approval. <laughs> that I did not expect. And actually seeing the Empress, I got a better grasp of who she was as well. I realized that she's just not this villainess that we are given to believe. She actually does want what is best for Malazan. 
perhaps under her terms, but that is her ultimate goal, is what is best for Melazan. There were so many little, I guess, hints about things to come earlier in the book that I didn't connect immediately. Like that Claw, who was on the ship with Kalam. I didn't think it was the person who helped that soldier who was chasing Kalam. Now, one thing, though, that I didn't like was Fiddler enlisting in the Melazan army again. Why? Yeah, I don't believe it's as simple as that. <laughs> yeah, Ericsson is very tricky, very devious. So I'm expecting something important is happening with Fiddler. So I definitely want to see him again. I should also bring up the dead houses, which are a very interesting idea. We saw one created in Darugistan, and then we got to see it up close, which I thought was really interesting, confusing, and I'm sure we'll see a lot more of them, given that they're actual portals. <laughs> yeah. The Warrens, we also did learn so much more about the Warrens in this book. And I'm finding them um, even more interesting that some have been in existence for such a long time. And people can wander them for centuries, millennia. I should also mention Heboric. I really liked Heboric to begin with. Towards the end, I didn't love him as much. He seemed much sharper, less compassionate, I think, than he was at the beginning. Perhaps that's because he was also imbued in some way with God magic. I don't know what to call it, given his invisible hands. And perhaps... Ericsson could have spent a bit more time on Heboric's transformation, I guess. Character-wise, I'm talking about, not the physical changes to him. I just didn't see enough, and perhaps I missed it in the first reading, but I didn't see enough to show me how he then became a little bit more sarcastic, not seemingly as kind as he had been at the beginning. Hmm. And last, Coltane and Dukan, because they are so interconnected. <laughs> okay. Initially, I was like, who is this Dukan? Why are we spending so much time with him? But as the book progressed and I got to learn more about him, hear his observations about this grueling journey, the chain of dogs. Coltane's attempt to save, I think it's 30,000 refugees. I became extremely attached to him. And this journey, <laughs> Coltane was a brilliant leader, no doubts about it. Watching him pulling together the Malazan army, the seventh army, with his own soldiers, drilling them, training them to get ready to take them on this incredible, dangerous journey across the continent to Aaron. Watching how he kept them alive, fought on their behalf, shed blood and tears over these refugees, watching Duca recording this journey, despairing, hopeful, and then despairing, wondering how they are possibly going to survive against what seems insurmountable odds, watching the courage of these soldiers again and again fighting to save these refugees watching Coltane doing everything he could in his power to protect these refugees, watching him <laughs> strategize, plan and defeat greater armies over and over and over again. 
Okay, I fell in love with the character of Coltane. He was everything you want a leader to be. Everything. He always put the refugees first, then his men. I loved that. You become so attached to these soldiers, to Duca, who are doing their utmost to save these people who have been forced out of their homes. I defy anyone to read this journey and not feel so emotional over it. I was not expecting it. <laughs> yeah, I really wasn't. That journey <laughs> ripped me apart, especially the end. Oh my God, the end. Yeah. And they get to Aaron or close enough. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, there's just so much I want to say here. That high fist. Oh my God. Yeah. I wish I could kill him 10 times over for what he did. He sent no one to their aid. He sent no one. He stopped everyone going to Coltane's aid. It was one of the worst betrayals of their own people I've ever seen. It was heartrending. And then Coltane decides to send the refugees on their own because he does not think he can get them to Aaron in time. Oh my God. <laughs> okay. As I'm reading about these refugees fleeing into Aaron, reading about them falling, unable to get up, reading about the soldiers in Aaron racing out to try to get as many of these refugees in. Well, my heart was broken just reading that. But no, no, no. Yeah, Stephen Erickson wasn't satisfied with ripping my heart out. No, he decided to stop all over it as well. <sighs> okay, I have to talk about this because it was written so well and it had such a huge incredible impact on me when i'm reading about all these soldiers lining up the walls or the battlements in aaron and then we see coltane and his few soldiers that are left running towards aaron and the high fist does nothing nothing I couldn't believe it. I thought, look, they're so close, they can touch them. They could maybe rescue them. They could push back the enemy. And the high fist did nothing. Wow, I was such a mess. <laughs> Reading about all these beloved characters dying one by one by one. Having to watch it. Having to witness it. Then they captured Coltane. Yeah, and no, they're not going to release him. They decide to crucify him. God, that broke my heart. That whole scene with the longbowman who broke down himself because he's like, I can't kill Coltane. Oh my God, I was sobbing as I'm reading this. I was sobbing as I'm watching this incredible man who has proved to be so faithful and determined and loyal to these refugees who had sacrificed everyone, including himself, to save them. And the high fist wouldn't send anyone out to help. And knowing that this great figure, Coltane, was being tortured because he had shown up the enemy leaders, Yet, yeah, where is the honour there? There was none. It made it very, very hard to empathise or sympathise with the enemy in this book. All they did was act like savages. And I don't care what they went through under Malazan occupation or during the conquest. 
How could anyone possibly ever justify crucifying kids? Kids. But wait, there's more, of course, right? I haven't got to the utter stupidity of the high fist in taking his 10,000 soldiers out to meet the enemy. And he surrenders them just like that. He doesn't even give them a chance to fight. And the enemy has proven completely without any honor throughout this book which he knows, and his soldiers are all crucified, including him, including Duca. Well, that broke my heart too. So many soldiers wasted for nothing, because this man was a coward and should never have been in this position of high fist. Coltane, he really was one of the great military minds, great leaders to accomplish something that no one thought was possible. The Chain of Dogs is one of the most magnificent pieces of writing I have read in so many years. It is something I will never, ever forget. Not ever. The way it made me feel. How angry I got at the actions of some of the characters. How devastated I was at the loss of others. It was brilliantly executed. Brilliantly so. There are a handful of books that have done that to me over the years. That's how I know that this was something really special. Because even now, what a month later after reading it, I am still a mess when I think about it. What happened to Coltane and his soldiers and everyone? If ever people think that war is glamorous, glorious, I'll get them to read this. Because this chain of dogs, this incredible journey, showed over and over again that war is anything but glorious. That it is the most horrific thing that we do as humans to each other, to each other. Now, I'm sure I left a lot of things out, but the things I mentioned are the ones that really had the greatest impact on me. Yeah. So let's jump into the summary and score for the book. This book shattered me. Broke my heart, stomped all over it, and left me a mess. <laughs> I loved this book more than I've loved anything in years. I cannot, cannot tell you how strong an impact this had on me. I absolutely loved the messages in it, particularly the anti-war sentiment. And the Chain of Dogs is, in my opinion, one of the best pieces of writing I've read in many years. Dead House Gates is definitely a step up from Gardens of the Moon. And I loved Gardens of the Moon, but the plots in particular in Dead House Gates are much more complex. And it's only as we progress through the book you see just how connected these storylines are. The characters also, I felt, were fleshed out a lot more, especially certain of the characters. And that ending, oh wow. Yeah, if you loved Gardens of the Moon, or you even liked it, were perhaps lukewarm, I strongly recommend you read Dead House Gates before you decide on this series. Because I think it might change your mind and make you as big a fan as I've become. Yeah, I highly recommend Dead House Gates to all fans of epic, complex fantasy with a large cast of characters and a lot to say about things like war, friendship, loyalties. It's more than just fantasy. 
it is a parallel in some ways to our own world. That's why I read fantasy, because they are parallels. Perhaps they have magic, which we don't have, but it's still people and the struggles that they go through, the conflicts that they go through. As for a score, now I am a notoriously hard scorer, yeah, but I am going to give Dead House Gates eight to eight and a half. And I never give out a 10, just so people know. But it was this good. In fact, I could even give it nine, but I'm leaving a bit of room for future books. Now, I only own two of the paperbacks. I really don't like mass paperbacks for such thick books, and it's very hard to find the hard covers. However, I know that Broken Binding is bringing out special editions. I hadn't decided whether to buy them after Gardens of the Moon, but after finishing Dead House Gates, I am definitely buying this series from Broken Binding, assuming I can get them because I loved this book so much. Yeah. <laughs> okay, my battery died. I can't believe it. I must have been talking way too long. Anyway, I am intending to read the third book now very, very soon. I was waiting to do the video because I can sometimes confuse whether I've read something from one book or another and I didn't want to make any mistakes here. And I also would ask any of you who do comment, please don't put any spoilers in the comments unless you head it up the top and you write your comment further down where people won't see it if they just look on the comment section. I honestly think reading any spoilers about these books will take away a large part of your enjoyment of them. And please don't refer to any spoilers from other books for those of us who haven't read them yet. Yeah. Anyway, of course, now I would love to hear what your thoughts are on this review on Dead House Gates. And you can let me know down in the comments or you can contact me on Instagram. Thank you all very much for watching. I really do appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did, then you can do the usual. You can like, comment and subscribe if you haven't already. I also have a Patreon account if you wish to support me in that way. I hope you all have a beautiful day and I'll see you next time. Bye.